Stay right there in your easy chair For 30 minutes of pleasure Don't you go, it's not in the show It's the talk of the desert It's the talk of the desert with Belinda Reed I just love coming home at night I turn around, she's a treasure Now, here's Melinda. My special guest on Talk of the Desert is, well, I'll call him an entrepreneur and an angel. And that's Mel Haver. Hell, welcome to Talk of the Desert. Melinda, I thought you'd never invite me. <laughs> well, I'm so tickled to have you here. I mean, you know a lot of stories that are going on in Palm Springs, and you have for several years, and then also you're heavily involved, and you're president of the board of the Angel View Curve of Children's Foundation. I, I am. And what a wonderful organization to be involved with. Thank you. I'm very proud of that. Well, it, talk about that. You, a little bit of your entrepreneurial ship is that you own Melvin's Restaurant and Ingleside Inn Correct. Hotel. Correct. And you've owned that for how long? 25, 26 years now. And you're only 27, right? There you go. <laughs> Started very young. That's right. Uh, let's first talk about Angel View. because I know you've got a hundred stories that you could talk about on Ingleside Inn and Melvin's. Um, and, but uh, Angel View has a wonderful event coming up at your restaurant on April 5th. Yes, twice a year, the Thrift Marts. We are supported substantially by funds from the Thrift Marts. We have eight of them spread throughout the Coachella Valley. And twice a year, we have a fashion show from the Thrift Marts, from the boutique the better clothing, the designer labels. It's a lovely affair. We have it at Melvin's Ingleside Inn. We have what we call a villa of values outside where we bring extra clothing in addition to what's being modeled. It's only $45 per person. Uh, and you can buy the clothes right off the models. You can go outside and shop after. You can shop beforehand. They're fabulous. I mean, you see things there. You see designer gowns that originally cost two, three thousand dollars and sold for two, three hundred dollars. Really? It's amazing. And the women, it's fun to see some of them actually getting a little bit of. I, I don't want to say fight, <laughs> but a little bit of. Uh, uh, who gets this B one? Bargaining, yeah. Uh, bargaining, whatever you <laughs> yeah. want to call it. But yeah. it's a great event. Uh, uh, they sell out every every time we have one. This is the twelfth. Uh, and they're very successful, and most important, it raises money for a really great cause. Mm -hmm. Now, you made an interesting comment that you can buy the clothes right off the models. I assume that the models get to go change into something else before Sometimes. you buy the clothes. Actually, have a male model there, and the ladies like to rip the clothes right <laughs> off the male model. He's probably the most popular model we have. I would imagine so. He's got to have a heart of steel to model with in those shows, i got to tell you. That's right. Let's tell our audience about the Angel View Crypto Children's Foundation. Angel View is probably one of the oldest charities in the desert. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not, we're not exactly exactly sure what year it was founded. Originally it was for polio with the Sister Kenny Foundation. And then when polio, thank God, was cured yes. with the Salk vaccine, uh, we turned, or the people at that time turned, to helping crippled children. The facility was up in Desert Hot Springs for all these years. We've uncovered a picture of Clark Gable turning one of the shovels, the original shovels of dirt for the place. The Eisenhowers were active. There's a lady in town by the name of Glory Hartley. At that time her name was Glory Mundy. She had a 16-year-old child, put him into Angel View, uh, got the Eisenhowers involved. Today she's a writer, a local writer, and, uh, but she was one of the founding people. And over the years, <clears throat> Angel View developed this facility in Desert Hot Springs, and at one time we had 52 children. Hmm. Uh, about, I want to say about five or six years ago, the state of California asked us to divest ourselves of a big facility and rather build small, home-like facilities for the children. And again, at, at that time, we were against the concept because we thought the children would do better in a bigger facility with more people that had the same problems they did. But we went along with it, and I must tell you, today we have 16 six-bed facilities, and the state was absolutely right. Our children are doing much better in the home-like environments. Uh, the economies of scale are not there. It costs us a little more to operate because we have therapists that now have to travel to 16 locations. And the 16 homes are spread throughout the Coachella Valley. And uh, so today, again, we take care of 96 children. We have work programs. It's a marvelous, marvelous charity. Very rewarding to be involved with Angel View. Absolutely. And uh, how long have you been involved with Angel View? I've, I've been involved, I've been on the board for 22 years. I've been the president for quite a while now. 
Uh, I like to say, uh, Melinda, I don't know that my work with Angel View will get me upstairs, but hopefully it will slow down my descent from going downstairs. <laughs> That's the best I can hope for. Uh, but uh, I got involved. Uh, do we have a minute to discuss yes, that? Absolutely. I, in 1979, I built the most beautiful discotheque called Cecil's in the Smoke Tree Shopping Center. And I tried to make some money with it during the day, and I couldn't. So I went to somebody and said, it was a nighttime activity, very, very successful. But this gorgeous facility sat empty all day. And I went to somebody and said, I can't make any money with it during the day. How could I do some good with it? And they said, well, one idea is why don't you run a dance for the high school kids on Sundays? So I said, okay, and I ran a dance for the high school kids on Sunday, and the community applauded me for that and said it was wonderful. And I said, well, okay, that's Sunday. What else do I do? And they said, well, why don't you try and do it for some kids that have problems? And I said, like what? And they said, Angel View. And I called up the administrator of Angel View, and it sounded a little strange to me because children in wheelchairs, what use could they make of a, of a disco? And I called up there, and they said they'd love to participate, and they could bring the children down the first Saturday of every month. And we started a program, we furnished milk and cookies. We couldn't, we couldn't flash all the lights that were typical in a disco because it would hurt some of the children's eyes, but they danced to the music in the wheelchairs. And at that time, I had just met my wife, who was a school teacher from Orange County. And I brought her there one Saturday, and I'll never forget this, and I, I was a little bit squeamish with the children, having children of my own and seeing all these poor children with the afflictions. And I was a little squeamish about being around them. And I saw my wife, who, the lady who's now my wife, walk up to one of the children in a wheelchair, take them by the hands out of the wheelchair, and spin them around in the air. And the kids squealed with the light. And she said, they're not eggs. They're not going to break. They love it. So the kids started coming down every Saturday. Uh, again, we hosted it. They brought them down. The kids looked forward to it. And then somebody from the board of directors walked up and asked me if I would be interested in serving on the board. Never having served on a board, and always a guy who could shoot from the hip and never having to talk to anybody else about doing something. I just did what I wanted to do. I said, okay, I'm a little scared of the responsibility, though. I'd be willing to serve on the board, but if I couldn't attend a meeting, would it be okay if I sent somebody in my stead? That's how conscientious I was. Mm -hmm. They looked at me like it was a strange question. They said, absolutely, and I went on the board. It's 22 years. I missed one meeting in 22 years. Really? Congratulations. Yeah. It's been very, very rewarding, and I'm very proud of it and very happy about it. That's terrific. Yeah, yeah. It's a great story. And really making a true difference in those children's lives. We do. We do wonderful. You were at our luncheon, and it's it just yes. it's just marvelous. Yes. What are the ages of uh, the children that are in well, the facilities? Well, today we have we have they're no longer children. We have we have people that have been there 22 and 23 really? years. They came in. They were six and seven years old. They're 30 years old now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we go up to 30 years old. Mm -hmm. And again, there's 16 houses spread throughout the Coachella Valley, and they're marvelous. You walk into these homes. They're spick and span. The kids have computers. A lot of them go to school. Uh, it's, it's just great. And we don't, we pride ourselves that we don't warehouse any children. If we don't feel we can improve the quality of, of their life, we don't take them. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean that we can mainstream them. They can't all be mainstreamed, unfortunately. But if we can't improve the quality of their life, we're not interested. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just, it's a marvelous um, uh, organization, and, and you've been president for how many years, you know? I can't even count that. Can't anymore. even I think count. It, no, I think it, <laughs> you ran out of fingers, uh, yeah, huh? Yeah, uh, they've <laughs> kept me there for quite a while, and I'm happy oh, to be there. Really, well, it's wonderful, and we need to support Angel View Cri Cripple Children's Foundation, especially with this fashion show coming up on April 5th. Well, I want it, because I knew you'd have some marvelous stories to share about that, um, but also the stories of how you started and purchased Ingleside Inn and developed it, and you've now owned it for the 26 years. Correct. And um, and you've got you must have some Palm Springs stories that aren't not fit to print, so to speak. I but I have to tell you that when I asked Mel to come on as a guest to talk about Angel View and then about his entrepreneurship, I had no concept that he's written a book called Bedtime Stories, Legendary Ingleside in Palm Springs, California, and. Uh, the stories are magnificent. And also, the sales of this book goes to benefit. It goes to benefit Angel View. I'm very proud that Arnold Schwarzenegger wrote the dedication mentioning that the fact that he stayed at the Ingleside Inn many times, and he's very happy that all the proceeds of the book do go to benefit the children of Angel View. And so far, it's raised $22,000 for Angel That's View. That's just magnificent. And I've had a lot of fun with that book. Absolutely, been, absolutely. That's been fun. Okay, now we're going to talk about some of the history of Ingleside Inn and, and Palm Springs. Now, 
uh, what you you came to Palm Springs and tell us the story about the about how you discovered this property. Well, I was in the automotive novelty business, and to explain what that is, I was the guy who made the hula dolls in the back of the car, the <laughs> dice that hung from the mirror, the religious statues for the dashboard, all the nonsense. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't my company. I worked for somebody else, but I had worked for, for him since I was 16 years old. And we prided ourselves on making 750 items, none of which ever did anything. <laughs> they were just novelties that, that the kids bought. And it was a very successful business. <clears throat> In 1974, I was going through what is known as a midlife crisis. Change of life and all that. Uh, women are known to have their change of life, but I was going through the similar uh, uh, thing. And we had a factory on the West Coast. In 1974, I came out to the West Coast. Prior to that, I'd been running back, back and forth between the West Coast and New York, where our other factory was, running this business. And in 1974, I decided to come out and take a place in the marina and spend some time in California. And instead of being in New York 20 days a month and spending 10 days in California, I decided to try California as my home and spend 10 days in New York. And I was going through this guilt. Of, of breaking up a marriage with children mm -hmm. involved. So I felt if I got away, maybe I'd feel a little better about it. So I came to California in 1974, moved into Marina Del Rey. A friend of mine invited me down to Palm Springs at the end of 1974. He had a home down here. And I came down here and quickly fell in love with Palm Springs, as everybody does, with the magic of Palm Springs. And one day I was, I was hanging around my condo. I had bought a condo on Ramon Road, 1975. Interest rates were 17%. I bought a condo on Ramon Road right across from the high school for $27,000 and they threw a party for me because nobody was buying anything because of the interest <laughs> rates. And I used to come down every weekend and just hang out. Typical Palm Springs weekend outfit, cut off jeans, sneakers, no socks, a t-shirt, and just hang out, ride your bike, just relax. There was a friend of mine who was running the Acatillo Lodge and that, at that time was owned by Jerry Buss. And a friend of, this friend of mine passed by the condo and said to me, what are you doing now? I said, nothing. He said, you want to take a ride? I want to, sh uh, I want to see a property that I'm going to show Jerry Buss tomorrow. And he drove me through the Ingleside Inn. And as soon as I, uh, as soon as I entered the, the property, there was something magic about it. I mean, there was just some charm there. And I'm not into old stuff. And, but there was just something magic in there. There's definitely charm. Yes. And the day was 100 degrees. And he came, he took me through the property, we drove around, as I say, it was lovely, but it was derelict. I mean, you could see that the landscaping needed some help, you could see that the driveway was pitted and rotted, and he took me into the dining room. I walked in the dining room, again, it was 100 degrees, Melinda, there was no air conditioning, there were probably 20 couples sitting there having lunch. Average age, I would have guessed, 85 years old. The ladies were in long dresses with white gloves, the men were all wearing jackets and ties, and I thought this was a movie set. I mean, it was unbelievable. No air conditioning, and these people were sitting there. And I didn't know what was going on here. And I was just, and I, 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 picture me in yeah, cut off jeans, right. and sneakers, and no socks, and a t shirt with all these people beautifully dressed. And I came to find out that it was being run as a very elegant private home that you had to be invited to to stay there. And uh, these people were paying $45 a day, including three meals. Again, the property was derelict but charming. And I was curious as to what they were asking for the property, and he told me that they were asking $350,000, and again, he was going to show it to Jerry Buss the next day. Well, the next day, I found out Jerry Buss wasn't interested. It was too small a deal for him, and it only had 20 hotel rooms. And something was in my head that I, I, I was interested in acquiring that property. Now, this was two blocks from the heart of Palm Springs, albeit there was a recession going on. Uh, empty stores all over town, nobody able to sell real estate, 17% interest rate, but there was something intriguing about the property. And uh, I, I decided I wanted to try and buy the property. I didn't have a whole lot of money. I'm guessing it is a lot of money, but not for making a uh, speculative real estate investment. I probably had in the world $250,000. But I was only making $45,000 a year working for this automotive company, and I was supporting my, my separated wife in New York and three children. Mm -hmm. But I had $250,000, and I said, if I buy the two acres, it's two acres in the middle of town, and what's the downside? It's always, if it's not worth three hundred fifty, it's got to be worth three hundred. And I just couldn't sleep, and I just wound up by the property not knowing what I was going to do with it. I had no intention to run a hotel or restaurant. None. Zero. And knew you nothing. have no background in that either. I knew nothing about it and cared less about it. I mean, I knew nothing about food. 
and most of my customers will tell you I still know nothing about food, but <laughs> back then, coming from New York, I ate a sirloin steak medium rare, a shrimp cocktail, and a salad with Thousand Islands, because that's all I knew. Mm -hmm. And where I came from, the only people who drank wine couldn't afford scotch. I mean, that's how I was brought up, okay? So, I mean, I was the last guy to be in the restaurant yeah. business. But I was intrigued by the property. So, make a long story short, I made an offer of $300,000. I had found out, incidentally, along the way, speaking to the manager who was trying to sell a property, it had an illustrious history. I mean, I'll go into that in a minute, but it had a grand history. And I made an offer of $300,000 with $100,000 cash, and they accepted the offer. And it was $200,000 mortgage at the Bank of America at 6% when interest rates were 17%. Amazing. So I bought the property, again, not having a clue what I was going to do with it. Well, Mel, when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about the history and the experiences you've had in the past 26 years with Ingleside Inn and Melvin's. Okay. We'll be right back with Talk of the Desert. We're talking to Mel Haber about the purchase of his Ingleside Inn and then his restaurant, Melvin's. And uh, we're going to do this real quickly. Tell us just how you, you took over the property with no uh, background in ho in hotels or restaurants or any interest in it. I'm yeah. Dead. <laughs> well, wh you 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 did some remodeling work on it, and um, yeah, the summer of '75. Originally, I was trying to just keep it as a real estate investment, mm -hmm. but uh, then I decided I'll take a shot at running a hotel and restaurant. And over the summer of 1975, the biggest convention that came to town to Palm Springs and bought out the whole desert was something called Magic Magic, which was the menswear convention. And they were due to come in in October. They came every year in October. So over the summer of 1975, I spent all my money. I paid people overtime to get ready for Magic Magic. Nobody told me that 1974 was the last year they were coming to town, okay? So I spent all this money to get ready for the end of October, and they never came back. 1974 was the last year because they actually got too big to come to Palm Springs, and they wound up in Vegas. But anyway, I spent the money, and I opened up in 1975 in October. Opening night... People were watching. Nothing was happening in town. Again, I repeat, there was a recession, so nothing was going on. And everybody was watching what this new guy in town was doing to the Ingleside Inn. And I opened uh, this certain night, and everybody had a maitre d' from the racket club. And the racket club was Palm Springs. And the maitre d' was pointing out all the important people in the dining room. And they were beautifully dressed. And they were all the heavy hitters from Palm Springs, the famous people. And I was really thrilled, nervous beyond uh, description. There was a young man who liked me, who took a liking to me over the summer. He was the parking lot attendant at Lion's English Grill down the block. And all night long, people would come up and say that Danny from Lion's English Grill sent us up. And I was thrilled. I met that night Jimmy Francioso, the actor, and on and on. And a lot of nice people came up. And I thought it was very nice of this kid to send these people up. In the middle of the night, with all these fancy people, I walked out to take a smoke. I smoked in those days. And I walked outside, and a Harley motorcycle pulls up with a guy on there dressed like when you ride a motorcycle with a pretty girl on the back. And I walked out and I saw this and I was almost panicked and I said, please do me a favor, it's my opening night, give me a break. And the guy smiled and he pulled away. An hour later, Danny Glick walked up and he said, you've been getting all the people I've been sending up? I said, Danny, you're a sweetheart, thank you very much. He said, what did you think of Steve McQueen and Ali McGraw? I said, I never got, they never came up. He said, what do you mean they never came up? They left, they were on a Harley, I told them to go right up there, they promised me they would. I said, oh my God. That was the first of putting my foot in my mouth to be repeated a thousand more times, I might add. <laughs> and it became a famous story of how I chased Steve McQueen and Ali McQueen. And I'll never forget the smile this guy had on his face when I told him, give me a break, please. It's my opening. <laughs> and the guy smiled from your head and just took off. I've always considered Ingleside Inn to be old Palm Springs yes. because it had a history before you bought it of all the famous people that stayed there. I mean, just the who's who of the movie industry. Of the world, not mm -hmm. the movie industry, of the world, Melinda. I found index cards. Giannini, who built known the Bank of America. Norman Vincent Peale stayed there all the time. Herbert Hoover. I mean, the names, aside from the movie stars, uh, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, Howard Hughes, uh, uh, Lily Pons lived there, uh, uh, Joel McCrae, Betty Gray. I mean, every name you could ever think of stayed at the Ingleside Inn. What the woman, the, the the woman who ran the hotel was named Ruth Hardy, of which there's a park today, and mm -hmm. she was a council lady in Palm Springs. I don't know what her strength was to get those kind of people there because they told me you had to be invited. She had no bar, you brought your own bottle, you drank out of your own bottle, and she was supposed to be a trip and a half, I gotta tell you, she was supposed to be quite a lady. Uh, but everybody in the world stayed at the Ingleside Inn, and I have some of those cards. Oh, fascinating. As a fact, I have many of those cards. Fascinating. Great, great names. Well, in your book, you tell a story about um, Frank Sinatra 
Can you share that story? Well, I have a couple of stories. You want the one of the photo or the pre-wedding well, dinner? Well, maybe, maybe both, because, I mean, Frank Sinatra is, you know, the desert's favorite son. Okay, so. when I first came to town, everybody knew where Frank Sinatra was on any given night. You would get a call, he's having dinner at Dominic's and he's on the way to this restaurant or he's here. Everybody knew where he was. And I was in business a couple of months and I was really upset because it's like I didn't exist because Sinatra had not yet visited my restaurant. I get a call one night, Sinatra's on his way over, okay? Frank Sinatra walked into my restaurant with his entourage, which I can almost name because he hung out with the same people every night. And I got to tell you, I have never been in awe of anybody. I was in awe of Frank Sinatra. Why, I don't know, but just his presence was intimidating. And he, he came in several times. Came in, he liked the lounge. He'd come in with his entourage, which was at that time uh, Jimmy Van Hughes and the songwriter, Leo DeRocher, the baseball manager, a guy who owned Ruby's Dunes, who I understand uh, took care of Sinatra, fed him, before he got, made his comeback from here to eternity. Uh, Barbara Sinatra, was, she was the only lady in the crew. There were like six guys that he hung around with, and Barbara Sinatra always sat there like a lady, very elegantly poised, and these guys just carried on like six guys would. <laughs> anyway, he spent a lot of time at Melvin's. One night he said, I want to talk to you, and I had been tipped off that he was going to get married at such and such a date by somebody who was on the inn. And, Sinatra sat, sat me down and said to me, uh, hey, kid, I want to make a, a party here. And he gave me the Saturday night. And I said, oh, my God, what an honor, Mr. Sinatra. And he said, come on, kid, you're a mishpucha. Mishpucha is a Jewish word for family. I got to tell you, after the meeting, I called my friends in New York and said, you got to hear this. Frank Sinatra called me mishpucha. I was so thrilled. But anyway, we sit down, and he's going to plan this dinner. And he said to me, uh, which kind of caviar do you have, gray or black? I didn't have a clue, but I figured I had a 50-50 chance of guessing right, okay? Then he asked me something else about the food, and at that point I was way over my head. I said, Mr. S., just wait a second. Let me get my manager to sit with us so we can plan this properly. And of course, that was my out. So the manager sat down, and we planned this dinner that I knew was going to be a pre-wedding dinner. This was for a Saturday night. I knew he was getting married Sunday at the Annenberg Estate. And Sinatra was so methodical, the way the vegetables should be placed, what kind of potatoes. I mean, I could not believe it that a man of such stature would be involved in such minutia. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, okay, but he was. Anyway, we, we made the dinner. That, and we asked him if we wanted, it was during the summer. And in hindsight, I think he probably chose my restaurant because every other restaurant in town was closed during the summer. So I think that's how we chose Melvin's. But anyway, and I asked him if he wanted the restaurant closed to the public. And he said, no, you can keep the patio open to the public as long as you can assure me privacy in the three inside dining rooms. And I said, for sure. And he hired his own security, and we had security there. And the night came, and we were very nervous about doing the proper job, and of course, for his pre-wedding dinner, Gregory Peck, and on and on in the family, and on and on and on. And the patio was jammed that night. Uh, not people knowing that Sinatra was having a party, just regular, regular Saturday night patrons. <clears throat> Early in the evening, uh, two guys walked in right out of the movies with a hat that said press or inquirer, cameras slung over their shoulders, and it was, it was, I couldn't believe it. And of course, security escorted them off the property. It was very obvious that they were from the inquirer. The night went very uneventfully. It was a lovely dinner, and, it won, and he had gifted Barbara Sinatra with a blue Rolls Royce. And the, the new Rolls Royce was in the driveway. It's one o'clock in the morning. My manager and I are walking outside with Mr. and Mrs. Sinatra, of course, well, she wasn't Sinatra till the next day. Right. Jilly Rizzo, my manager, and myself. And as Frank and Barbara got in the car, I turned around to my manager and said, I can't believe we got through the night without an incident. And we start to walk back in, and all of a sudden we hear a commotion. And it turns out that the inquirer had sent the two guys that were obviously reporters as a decoy to be thrown out. At the same time, they booked uh -huh a party of four on the patio, beautifully dressed people, two ladies and two men, and they were the real reporters. They hid behind a tree, and when, when Sinatra pulled out, they jumped from behind the tree and they took a picture through the windshield of Frank and Barbara. Jilly Rizzo ran up, grabbed the camera from the guy's neck, ripped it open, ripped the film out, exposed it, and threw it on the floor. Monday morning, the picture appeared in the Inquirer. Now, there's, there's two parts to that story. First of all, Frank, when, when Mr. Sinatra got home, he called me up and said, Mel, 
what happened is when they took the flash, the car veered towards them. And he was afraid that they were going to report to the police that he was trying to run them down, when in fact he had been so startled by the flesh in his sure. eye that the car just veered. Sure. So he called me up to tell me to make sure I tell the police that that's what happened. That was no problem. I figured out later that what the inquirer does, they're very clever. What the camera hanging around the neck didn't take the picture. They had a camera in the pocket that took the picture that goes back in the pocket, and you rip open the other uh, camera, and you sacrifice the camera to get the picture. And that was one part of the Sinatra story. Yeah. And the picture appeared Monday. And of course, Sunday, I was a little upset because I was hoping to get some nationwide publicity out of the fact that Sinatra had his pre-wedding dinner. Mm -hmm. But the wedding at the Annenberg Sunday was all the headlines, was all the pictures, as it should be. That's right. Well, Mel, we only have three minutes left of oh, this oh, half hour. I know. The story is fabulous. And you've got so many more stories in the book, which is on sale that benefits the Angel View Crippled Children's Foundation. Yes, you can Foundation. buy it at the Ingle Side Inn, Super Crown, Barnes & Noble, Amazon.com, any place. Okay. Wonderful. It's just wonderful. But in the three minutes, what can we talk about? Is there What's in the future for Ingleside Inn and for uh, Melvin's? Well, I, I don't know that anything different. Uh, okay. I, have been, uh, I am flattered that people think I have maintained the tradition of the Ingleside Inn, kept it looking and charming as it has been. Uh, <clears throat> every year business seems to get better, thank God. It, it's been a wonderful experience for me. It's been a wonderful trip for me. Uh, Palm Springs in the desert has been wonderful to me. I'm a very lucky guy. I, and Lifestyle with the Richard Famous uh, chose Melvin's as one of the top ten restaurants they, in the country. They did, and I, we appeared on Lifestyles on two different occasions for two different reasons. One was a run away with the Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, mm -hmm. which they did with uh, Fivish Finkel, uh, an actor. And the first time was just on the merits of the English side. And we've been on mm -hmm. 60 Minutes. We've been on Phil Donahue. We've been all over. <laughs> it's been, a, I got to tell you, quite a run. <laughs> Absolutely. If I knew what I was doing. And it. then we have to talk just very briefly about Brian, your maitre d'. Oh, Brian is the greatest. Brian is the greatest. Brian is allowing me to keep my name on the restaurant one more year. <laughs> He's been there 26 years. He's never worked in another restaurant. He won Southern California Restaurant Writers Maitre d' of the Year eight years ago. Yeah. He is nominated this year for Maitre d' of the Year for the entire state of California, and I got a feeling he's going to make it. Yeah. And How he, exciting. he is Melvin's, yes. He's he, the personality. He there. sure is. And then let's just do a recap of the fashion show for Angel View uh, on April 5th. April 5th. Please call 322-2440. Ask for Lisa. Get your reservation. It's only $45 for a wonderful cause. Not only that, you'll make back twice your money in one of the bargains that you buy there. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. You'll see a lot of fabulous people. Everybody dresses beautifully. It's just a great affair. That's great. Well, uh, Mel, thank you so much for your time for Talk of the Desert today. And truly, your book is wonderful. There's great photos in it and of all the, the people. Um, and sometime I'll have to have you back and tell you the, the story about the, the photo of you and Frank Sinatra, how that happened. Great and story. so it is a great story. Buy the book, support Angel View, um, and then you'll know about the photo that's hanging in your lounge, <laughs> how that was taken. You'll yeah. know the secrets. You'll love it after you read the story. That's right. Um, uh, Mel Haber, thank you again for your time today and for joining me on Talk of the Desert. Melinda, thank you. Thank you, Adi. For more information, email TOTDTV at questoffice.net and visit talkofthedesert.tv on the web.